Welcome to episode 204 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. And I'm Karen Dexter. And we and have I'm here a- too. <laughs> and we have a very special guest this week, uh, a person who's been name dropped on this show probably more times than anyone else and has not yet appeared. Uh, they're also one of the producers over at Watchtower Database and making a very long overdue appearance. Welcome, Maddie Washburn. I'm, I'm wondering if there's like anybody in your audience who has like heard my name on the podcast but hasn't watched watched our database and they're like, oh my god, it's finally happening! They're oh, here. I'm, I'm sure. I'm, they I'm exist. positive. <laughs> they're a real person. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I mean, I'm so I'm so excited to be on. We were talking about this like before uh, before we started recording and everything, but like. I've been listening to y'all for years now, and like it's weird. We've become friends, and now I'm mm-hmm. here. Like it was just a a podcast I threw on to like pass the time, and now things have just shifted. Over I know years. it's it's amazing, and that's why I said you know a, a very long overdue appearance because literally we we I would say pr- almost once an episode, as you've heard listening to it, like we mention you because we don't know what the hell we're talking about ever, <laughs> like. Daddy knows. They'll let us know. I started to feel I started to feel so bad over the pandemic because since I wasn't driving, like I wasn't staying like as up to date with the yeah. podcast. And then I would just like listen to six or seven episodes back to back and be like, oh, there were a lot of things I was supposed to tell them, Mark. <laughs> that's that's a lot of us. That's, yeah, that's I, all I, I us. applaud is... you for you know staying with us for eight hours. <laughs> it, it is not your responsibility to point out what we don't know because it's a lot. <laughs> So that's why we're very, very happy on here. Um, but we'll be talking about uh, Patriot Act and the Great Brain Robbery this week. So I'm very, very excited to talk about the Great Brain Robbery because that's the one you specifically requested. Um, but starting out, we'll do Patriot Act and I'll do my, my usual half-assed uh, summary here. So in this one, General Wade Eiling, uh, Furious Academy, yielded to the Justice League, injects himself with a Nazi super soldier serum turning him into basically the Hulk, and he goes on a rampage to prove that many humans are dangerous and faces off against a group of non-power leaguers, only to realize that he's the true threat. So, I found this episode fine. What did you two think about it? <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Yeah? I, I, I put it on, and I ended up enjoying it more than the episode that I asked to come on for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what what about this did you find super compelling? Because I thought it was just like forgettable for the most part. Well, God, there's so much there's so much working for it. Uh, I don't know where to start. I mean, obviously from the get go, there's the the whole riff on Marvel that mm-hmm. they're doing, right? You know, the Project Captain Nazi is obviously an analog for Captain America. Uh, the 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 Wade Eiling using the the super soldier super Nazi serum or whatever. Uh, is obviously uh, a reference to the Hulk or Abomination or Red Hulk, whichever one you want right. to say. The Hulk whichever mythos, version of the Hulk you want, you know. Um, but I think deeper than that is like the political messaging of the uh, of the episode. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's it's titled Patriot Act after the Patriot Act, yeah. right? It's a it's a it's a post nine eleven world. I know it aired in two thousand six, but animation usually takes like a year or two to to kind of get through the door so it was a little you know fresher on the mind when they were making it and a lot of the the narrative of the story is about american imperialism and 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 finding new ways to uh to 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 govern and you know law enforcement and stuff like that rather than doing what we've always done and still to this day do you yeah. know, uh, like, like General <laughs> Eileen is literally a fascist who's explicitly afraid of communism in this episode. Yeah. And, and like, like they go out of their way to give him a line about we'd be living under a red flag, Waller. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> it, what's amazing is how relevant that sort of ideology was then and still is now to some degree. And you're like, oh, it's been like 20 years. You think we would have moved on that now? No, no, no we never do. Maybe gotten worse. Yeah, exactly. We might have regressed, in fact. Pro- propaganda machine go burr. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, I mean, even Waller has that great line when they're at dinner of our enemy, our enemies never quite as evil as we imagine, and sometimes we aren't as good. Mm-hmm. Like, that's that's it. That's the thesis. That, that's the whole thesis for basically the entire universe. And it is interesting to kind of position Waller as this sort of midpoint 
considering that she was one of the primary antagonists in the last season and you know she's sort of had this complete turnaround where now she's like eh, the league's not so bad they're all right we're friendly ish I don't know. I, I mean, I do love her, and it was fun to see um, her back and have CCH Pounder back, obviously. And, of course, J.K. Simmons is fantastic, always, all the time. I love that they did not manipulate his voice at all after he went Hulk. See, I, found that, I found that I found that very weird. Like, no, like, it is it is weird, but that's yeah. why I loved it, because you don't expect them to do it that way, and then they do. Well, and especially because, you know, J.K. Simmons is a brilliant actor, but also a brilliant voice actor. Like, he could have very easily put on a slight infection, and you're like, I wonder why there's a weird creative choice on either his part or the part of, like, the, the voice director on this to not do that. Because I found it very distracting when he's got this, like, gray face and these weird, like, black and yellow eyes and these massive teeth, and he's just talking like normal J.K. Simmons. It's definitely distracting, but I think <laughs> if we want to give a reason to them doing it, uh, and, you know, I, I can't say this as like a fact or anything, but to me, I feel like it, it's a, a way to keep the humanization of the character. That way you can like kind of like relate and see that it's still a human being mm-hmm. that is making these terrible decisions that is, you know, trying to, to rule by force and everything. And, and it kind of gives you more of a, a window of uh, insight and reflection to be like, wait this could be any of us kind of situation. Way to show up and just like be way smarter than Cameron and I when it comes to this sort of analysis. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, we're just like, it's just weird to hear his voice and you have actually something very thoughtful and meaningful to contribute and like, well, way to just show us <laughs> what we've been missing well, I for the last five he years. I punched. <laughs> yeah. I like the I, punching too. <laughs> I like the, the, the smash things. <laughs> but, you know, you, you mentioned like the the um the spy smasher stuff at the very beginning because this episode opens in kind of a weird way it opens with this black and white sequence of uh like a nazi scientist in you know some german castle very you know stereotypical about ready to conduct an experiment to your point similar to what happens with steve rogers and the captain america serum and gets stopped by the spy smasher who i'm assuming is an actual character from dc comics at some point he is so, so what I learned in my minimal research on this to try and impress Maddie <laughs> is um, there were a group of seven heroes that existed either right before or right after the JSU. The seven soldiers of victory. Yes. Okay. Uh, and see, th- this I... is the team. So it's Spy Master. Uh, Stars and Stripes replaced uh, Star Spangled Lad and someone else. Um, and then it's Green Arrow, Wally. Uh, Vigilante and Shining Knight. Oh, I think that's seven. okay. Uh, Crimson Avenger as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and Speedy, which explains why they just randomly drop in Speedy for, I think, the one and only time in this entire universe. Yes. My recollection. Yes. Is it the same model from Teen Titans? It's not it's... the same exact model, but it is designed specifically to, like, ape that model and bring it into the yeah because the hair was very uh like flat to the head which was yeah, very teen james thing. james tucker said that they uh that that's an intentional uh teen titans reference uh okay and that makes which, sense which which means which means now i've got now that i'm here i have to pitch titans talk Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm, just, I'm just saying you just did flash and substance kid flash's <laughs> costume is in the museum we're doing Patriot Act now. Speedy is here. Bruce Tim is in, is listed as an executive producer on Teen Titans. We, well, Chris, is, that's <laughs> we, we've talked about it. Well, <laughs> I probably ended up cutting all this out, so I'm not held accountable for my decisions. <laughs> um, we we have talked about it, but uh, we, we we shall see. Um, Maddie, if we keep talking about it the whole episode, he can't cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten very busy these days. <laughs> Editing a podcast is a lot of work. I feel the pain. I feel yeah. the pain. It's so hard now that I'm back at work to find time to do watch Terra Database stuff, and I feel like I'm letting everybody down. Yeah, exactly. I feel, I feel yeah, guilty. Yeah, you have real fans. We have yeah, yeah, true. you and our parents. <laughs> oh, that's sweet that you think my parents listen. They don't. My mom says she does, yeah. and that, that's enough for me. Right. I don't Cameron's ask any mom. questions. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. We always appreciate you maybe listening. But so that... that Opening sequence, though, like it's fun, but even as I was watching it, it's done in this weird style that feels like it's, you know, kind of referencing or almost aping serialized like 
films of that time. And so as I'm watching, I'm like, wait, is this is this a flashback? But it almost felt like a movie within a movie to some degree. Like it felt like someone was watching this. It was very it was Hollywood. Fictional. Yeah. Yeah, it felt very Hollywood and stagey. And then, you know, it's ultimately revealed that it's been Eiling reading a report. So I guess this is what he imagines all this stuff looks like, which is an interesting yeah. thing in of itself. Like that's how he imagines when he reads like military reports is that they're old fashioned movie serials. Yeah. Well, how do you read it? I'm sure <laughs> there's James Bond in there. <laughs> that's true. Everyone's everything, holding yeah. a, a martini glass. I just love that. I believe this is actually the first episode of Justice League Unlimited that like I got my fiance to sit through with me. Mm-hmm. And so it starts with that, and she's just sitting there like, wait. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> Do I need to know any of this? Yeah. It's like, I mean, don't I, worry. None of these characters are going to show up again ever. Ever. Ever again. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of hokey. It's fun. I love his, like, ridiculous submarine plane. He flies off in the end. It kind of reminded me of Sky Captain the World of Tomorrow. Oh, God. This, I, the CG on that. Like, I, 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 I specifically mentioned it. I was just like, oh, my God, this is beautiful. It's so <laughs> out of place. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was watching that, and I, I had this similar thought, Chris, of, like, this is very Hollywood. And I was questioning, like, would we have rather, like, I like the, the black and white, but, like, this is 1940s. What if they did it in the style of like the old Fleischer cartoons? Mm, that like, could have been would really that fun. have landed yeah. if they animated in that same like very rotoscopy style? That could have been a fun way to do it. it yeah, it just it felt a little bit tonally and visually like out from everything else we had seen. It just threw me off, especially so. since we've been to World War II in this universe. That's true. Oh, that is true. <laughs> yeah. And, like, and we've, we've had... seen what World War II looks like. It was yeah. in color, surprisingly. It was in color. Who knew? I thought that didn't start appearing until the mid-19th century. Well, see, that yeah. only happens when you've got a time travel machine in the mix. That's true. Well, I mean, that's why JFK won, because he brought color. Though, <laughs> this does raise the question, is Spy Smasher the first superhero in the DCAU? I love how you bring uh, that up like we could answer no, that question. Jonah Hex. <laughs> Jonah Hex. Oh, yeah, was Jonah, Hex. Oh, Jonah Hex. Jonah Hex. Jonah right. Hex yeah. is earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Jonah Hex and Batlash and um, I'm trying to remember who else is part of his team way back in the day. But you're right. Uh, he would have been one yeah, of the, the first. The Native American one of chief the earliest. I know he's before Soul Shadow. Power and Sparky. Wait, which one? Which one's Sparky? Is that a Soul Power and Sparky were the the oh, duo? Static Shock. That's right. I forgot that uh, Soul Power had the sidekick of Sparky because I forget everything. Professor Menace. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah it's, it's, they didn't well i guess like shining knight too was technically oh if yeah, we want to go how do, how do we classify like superheroes if we go back to king arthur days that's true shining knight etrigan who's yeah etrigan. Like, kind of on the fence but we count him he's part of the justice league so he can i can't believe y'all are y'all are out acknowledging me <laughs> <laughs> it will be the last time this episode we do <laughs> hands down but yeah so Eiling reads this report, and then we go from there to a dinner that he's having with Waller, where, as we were talking about, he's basically saying, like, you know, the, like, the league is still a menace. You know, we didn't, like, strike a deal. Like, we lost. We surrendered. And Waller's more or less like, yeah, they're fine. Don't worry about it. I I loved I loved that, like, those lines. It, like, it just hit me real hard. He mm-hmm. said, what, what was it specifically? He said, uh, when one side loses ground and the other side gains, that's not a... a a it's not treaty peace. that's yeah that's surrender yeah and she and she just responds it's a different world learn to live in it <laughs> and and like as soon as she said that i was just like god damn she told him to get woke <laughs> she did like it's god it's so funny that like we live in this world where there's there's still so much like get your politics out of my superheroes this was never a thing and then you, i go like, and throw this on from 15 years ago and be like oh it wasn't it was never a thing yeah no it's it's always been a thing i love when people special like like what the, the x-men are to like you know why are the x-men so woke why are they like an example of why you know, are progressive the policy so or like woke? civil rights and you're like did you never read an x-men comic yeah it's not even the subplot it's the plot <laughs> it's literally the plot <laughs> it's, it's I no subtext i, do, I don't understand <laughs> it but yeah, that, that conversation they have is so interesting. But the, the one line that really jumped out to me is uh, Eileen says to Waller, you've got some onions. And I was like, is this like a weird way of like saying you've got balls in a kid's show because you can't say that? Like, I don't think I've ever heard the phrase you've got some onions. Have either of you ever heard this? 
You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna Google that and see if anyone <laughs> has ever said that. You've got some onions. I mean, luckily it's J.K. Simmons saying it, so he can say it and it still lands. But it was a very bizarre line that threw me off. Uh, oh, the 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 the, the exact the exact post that I'm finding on EnglishForums.com is from this episode. This episode. This episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the the lines before it uh, is, don't tell me the bleeding hearts of Congress got to you. Amanda says, I eat them alive. Uh, you would, too. You've got some onions. Is it a cooking joke? I don't, that's the thing. That's I don't how I'm going to read it as, is she's not eating them raw. It's a slow roast and some onions in a crock pot. They're simmered? Yeah. Maybe caramelized at this point? I think... Honestly, it's probably a double entendre that has elements of both readings in it. Yeah. I, I they're, think they're thinking so many layers above us. It's like an onion. So, yes. <laughs> Cameron, throwing out the dad jokes here. Not a the dad Shrek joke, jokes. a Shrek joke. I only do Shrek jokes now. 2022, it's Exclusive just Shrek jokes. I mean, you know, I think you're right, though, Maddie, because there's there's that and there is one more, at least what I read as a uh, a, a food based double entendre when Eiling says that they were tossed around like a salad by a Superman. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> Maybe he's just hungry. That's why he's well, so like so angry. They all the are time. at dinner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. We, do we ever see him actually eat? No, they're just drinking like orange soda because they can't be drinking even like wine because it's a kid's yeah. cartoon. <laughs> so, it's it's kind of interesting. But then. You know, so we go from there, and it's up at the Watchtower, and everyone, including Superman, is spread thin across the, the galaxy. They're basically just down to, like, the bare bones of who's available, and so the remaining team has to fill in for Superman on a mission, which is to attend, like, this metro, basically like a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade happening through the middle of Metropolis. And it's so, it's so cheesy and such a thing that you would put in a kid's cartoon and also so perfect that, like, these heroes are being, like, thoroughly embraced and loved and supported but they feel like they're being degraded because they're not actually saving the world they're just standing there waving and i really love how star girl gets like so upset about it and then totally put in her place by both green arrow and then was the, the police captain who goes over and talks to them for a little bit i i loved i loved when they they like cut away to the crowd and everyone's like where's superman yeah, <laughs> yeah it, right. it was kind of a weird mixed message because it like was. it's not that she's wrong like Star Girl is not impossibly wrong. Like we're not like they don't want to see us. And like this is this is also a, a development of her character that like has been a thing since the the episode she did with Supergirl. You know where she just feels like she's in the shadow of other right. leaders. And, all the time. and I think going back to like the political messaging of it all, uh, I, I the I, probably the reason that they did the unpowered heroes here was to be like look like. You know, we are talking about the, the, the government issues and stuff like that. And normal people without powers are the ones like you've got you. You're able to do something. You're able to, to make change. You're yeah. able to fight back against the wrongdoings and stuff like that. I think it was a, a message of trying to empower not just the heroes within the, the story itself, but the audience. Right, just everyday people. I, I really like that they chose deliberately to have, yeah, only non-powered League members there. Because, like, it, essentially the only metahuman the entire episode ultimately is Eiling. Um, mm -hmm. And he has that, you know, brief moment of self-awareness where he finally figures that out and then seems to just fly away with no consequence. Just like any other politician. <laughs> That's, <true. laughs> That's, That's, I think, the point, maybe. That was my one, like, big gripe with the thing is that, like, it just resolves itself. He's just like, oh, okay, bye. Yeah. Like, well, yeah oh, I mean, as, as we brought up very briefly beforehand, this is just a Hulk story. And what's more Hulk than just running away at the end? That's true. <laughs> Having no consequences for your actions Yeah, like you entirely. can't make it more Hulk-like. Yeah, it, it's... I think maybe that's part of the reason I found it a little bit underwhelming is that the, the ending just doesn't really have an ending whatsoever. But there there is some good stuff in there. And I one of the things I really like about this episode is that it... it Gives a lot of time to Vigilante, who we we had a little bit of him in oh, was he? Hunt, Hunter's Moon. But what I love here is that he's he's the hype man. Like he's literally going around and like hyping up all the other heroes around him. Like it's and it helps that it's Nathan Fillion, obviously doing the voice. But it's actually like really sweet. And he has this 
kind of awareness and confidence the rest of them around him don't and where he's actually going and like really being supportive of them which i thought was just a nice thing for a hero to vigilante do his... was so much fun in this episode he's great it's like after we finished it uh my fiance was just like i, I really like vigilante and i was like yeah shit he, he shows up in a couple other episodes but, well <laughs> he but, doesn't talk but, ever again <laughs> But like, yeah, no, I was, I was going to say that like in regards to, to him being the hype man, like it kind of going back to the like, Hey audience, you don't have superpowers, but you can do something. Yeah. Like it really helps to, to give like a spotlight on like, Hey, like even though you don't got superpowers, there's something about you that's special. And, 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 and like, even if you can't see it, others can vigilante right here is going to show that to you right now. All of these With his people motorcycle don't, don't know and they're... guns. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, is it is it someone in the audience that makes that point of like, why is Vigilante here? He uses guns. Yeah, someone does say it, which is interesting. Yeah. Especially because which, right which around... I do think is is fun that like he doesn't show off his skill. He's always hyping up the other people. So, you know, uh, Stargirl gets to make fireworks. Shining Knight gets to show off uh, winged victory and a sword from Merlin. Uh, it's like nothing is about like the violence, except a sword. Yeah, except for the sword. Except for they eventually but start a really, magic sword. A magic sword, though. Um, okay, and you mentioned this beforehand, Cameron. So I'm going to give you the opportunity now because Sir Justin <sighs> makes a comment about finding fighting someone. I didn't clock it because I don't care. But you, who loves <laughs> Arthurian myth, I'm going to give you a moment here to tell us who he fought and why that matters. And when the I say tale. a moment, I mean a fucking moment. <laughs> <laughs> the tale of Blunderbore. Uh, Blunderbore is uh, one of the three giants that Jack slays in Jack the Giant Slayer, mm -hmm. which I learned is not Jack and the Beanstalk. They are two separate stories. Really? Did not know that until oh, this morning. I... Yeah. Damn, Jack has a whole continuity. <laughs> yeah, so Jack has been around since Arthurian days. Jack was kind of the original Tom Sawyer, where mm -hmm. he's just this kid who's too smart for his own good, and everyone kind of hates him. And so Arthur's like, hey, Jack, go slay these three giants that are, like, messing with the village over there. Um, Blunderbore is the second giant he slays. He is also the original, like, quote-unquote nice guy where he will kidnap husbands and fry them, kill them and fry them, and then present the meal to the wives to try and win them over. And when they refuse him... He then eats the wives. You would describe this person as a nice guy. The the like the the like, you know the like the nice guy who oh, okay. like, is tries to be nice and then immediately turns <laughs> on you in a second. Tips his fedora. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah he, he's a milady character. <laughs> he holds doors for people and occasionally eats them. Yeah, and if if you don't say thank you after holding the door, he you know roasts you online. Yeah, who ha who has not? He docks been. you in this situation <laughs> right that everyday common situation where some guy just fries up your your spouse <laughs> God. and then if you don't like it that's the one you. thing i'm looking forward to about getting married yeah the blunderbores <laughs> of the world god <laughs> cameron i appreciate you did that and actually it's surprisingly succinct about a time so thank you yeah it, it's a fun one <laughs> it's a fun one but i think I think one of the things about this episode that I didn't really love was the battle itself feels pretty repetitive. Like it doesn't, it goes on for a long time and it doesn't really shift in any different directions. Basically just every hero gets taken out by, um, by Eiling until there's really no one left, but the, the people to step in and say like, Hey, no, you're the problem. And I appreciate the ending of it, but the battle itself just felt, yeah, like a little bit it kind of kept going on and on. I did love when they beam in some reserve leaguers and it's Crimson Avenger and Speedy, and even Green Arrow's like, really? You brought in my former sidekick to help us here? Former partner? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get narratively uh, about the battle going on too long, but there were so many points where I was just like, wow, that's such a cool shot. And it was only on screen for like a couple of frames. And mm -hmm. like somebody boarded that and animated it. And like... like that that one uh, that one shot of like Green Arrow and Speedy having their bows pulled like you see that screenshot online all the time yeah. and I thought that it was gonna be like a longer shot than it was going back and revisiting the episode for the first time in forever and it's just there and gone 
Yeah, and I'm second just, and a half. And I'm just like, wow, they took the time to like just plot this out, like the, it's, and stage all the action as as you know thoroughly as they did. Mm-hmm. And that to me was impressive. That was enough to like keep my attention, even if narratively it was just like, okay, I get it. They're 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 getting their asses handed to them. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, but each of them like got their moment. Like you see Stripe try and take down Eiling, and Eiling rips the armor off. Yeah, uh, and it's about to crush him. Yeah, and then a kid comes and saves the day, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, kids behind kids behind uh, construction equipment always cool yeah always swinging safe. around a wrecking ball always a thumbs up from from warner brothers those kids i think were supposed to be uh what jack the kirby's newsboy news legion right yeah, yeah. so that was a, that was a fun little reference there's so much like packed into this sto- like it's obvious to me at least that this one was made for adults rather than you know kids because mm-hmm. like all of the references that they throw in here were like older more obscure stuff that's like deep cuts gonna be for people who like haven't necessarily been watching the cartoons but like were in tune with the comics yeah 10 20 30 years beforehand right i mean that's why your fiance enjoyed this episode so much right <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> yeah it's like oh finally the newsboy legion is getting their time in the spotlight oh i love seeing jeremy jordan and the newsies show up here <laughs> i mean and, and maddie you bring a very good point which is like you know, now it's super easy for us to look at that and go like, oh, I'm sure someone has put online like the trivia of where the this came from. But in 2006, you know, the Internet obviously existed, but wasn't quite what it is now. It wouldn't have been quite as easy to just go to like literally the DCAU wiki and find it like that really was for the people who wouldn't know who that is, because it, that culture of, oh, I know this is referencing something. Let me go figure out what it's referencing didn't really exist yet. Right. So and and that's the thing that you know we've been enjoying about this season in particular, which you know, uh, from a narrative perspective, does not hold up especially as much as season two. But it's been just like how deep and weird and crazy they'll go with their comics pulls, like the yeah, was, like, like the the battle at the Earth's core, or whatever we did a little while back. Like that one in particular, I was like, I don't know who any of these people are. Like mm-hmm. any, I usually at least vaguely know who it is. Like I have no idea what's going on with this. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of nuts what they decided to uh, to throw in this season. They just decided to go all over the place and like. It definitely makes it feel a bit more disconnected from everything else when, yeah. like, the Cadmus story right before it was just like, we're connecting everything now. And this season's just like, okay, but now we're going into different directions <laughs> and end everything. But, like, it's it's really appreciated that, like, that they did do that uh, uh, just because, like, it's obviously for people, you know, who cared about this stuff and weren't necessarily uh, cartoon watchers. An older audience. Yeah, an older audience yeah, of comics I, fans. I, that's what they watch. So. so curious what the writing room must have been like for this season, where it's like all the writers just trying to out-nerd <laughs> each other. Like, who can make the deepest cut in their episode? Well, so you know what's funny is that Seven of the 13 episodes were all written by the same guy. Dwayne McDuffie? No, they were all, uh, seven of them were written by Matt Wayne. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I think. So he won, is is what you're saying. (laughs) He out nerded the rest. Yeah, he was the biggest nerd in the room. Yeah, and I, I I know Dwayne McDuffie is still on this season. He may have done more story than actual script, though. Yeah, so I'm looking at it. Yeah, Matt Wayne, one of Dwayne McDuffie's college friends, and uh, wrote a lot of milestone comics. And he wrote for yeah, Legion of Superheroes, Batman, The Brave and the Bold, Ben Ten, and the Superhero Squad show. Yeah, so Matt Wayne wrote seven of them, and then Dwayne McDuffie wrote one, two, uh, wrote four of them, and then had no wrote five of them, and then had story on two of them. Okay, yeah. So it was it was basically. It was Matt Wayne and Dwayne McDuffie, <laughs> old college friends, just being like, hey, I let's love do that. whatever we want. Good for them. Good for them to get to that point where like, hey, we can just do whatever the hell we want on this show and it's still going to get made and people are still going to love it. So, I, lo- honestly, I love that like, it, it doesn't seem like Bruce Tim ever told them no. No. <laughs> I think at this point especially, I think they knew like this was going to be their last season because right. the last one was supposed to be their last and like, okay, we have one more, just do whatever you feel like. Let's go. Let's go crazy with it. Um, right. Which is pretty fun. And then 
and especially the next episode, we'll talk about just like how crazy it gets, which is you know really fantastic. But yeah, th- this one does kind of just end abruptly with Eiling just realizing like, oh, I guess I'm the menace. And then I guess like the the final button message on it is that you know the it's trying to teach us as an audience what the characters in this this town, the civilians learn, which is that the other heroes are heroes too. So like it ends with all the kids being like, oh no, like I'm gonna be you know Crimson Avenger, I'm gonna be vigilante, um, which is cute but it also felt a little bit like you're telling us that these characters are cool you have showed us they're cool but like this little button is a final reminder of like hey in case you forgot these characters are cool i'm like don't you don't have to tell me this i know i think it just kind of you know puts that 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 like message of like hey you know how like like how i've been saying it's 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 about audience empowerment mm-hmm. i think they're ending it on like the kids realizing like hey i i can I can be these heroes. They don't have powers. I don't have powers. Like it's, it's, it's the inspiration. And I think it's just them trying to say, Hey, I want you to walk away from this episode inspired. (laughs) Do something. I want to see the kid that who always wants to play the creeper. Oh my God. Jumps around everywhere. (laughs) God, I I, I need that kid in my life. Wait, no, hold on. (laughs) <laughs> Hold on, that's probably that's that's probably a, a a sentence that can be taken out of context. We, we all we we have great admiration for the kid who loves the creeper and dresses accordingly and goes and just embraces himself. One thing, one one moment that I do want to like point out in between where we were talking about the fight yeah. and where we're talking about the end mm-hmm. now is specifically when uh, when Eiling's beating the shit out of Sir Justin. Oh, so good. yeah. Uh, First, like, 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 like that whole back and forth between them is is just it's great writing. I think the staging of the shots with like Sir Justin trying to get up with you know Eileen there in the background is just like it's beautiful. It it, it looks brilliant. But that old woman coming in at the end and saying, "How many of us do you have to kill to keep us yeah. safe?" Just like that shit cuts. That's a great line. Like, like. like God, I wish I could write anything that good. I know, right? <laughs> well, well, it's. I think it's now after after the Suicide Squad. I feel like that joke is so much, or that line is so much funnier after Peacemaker's line of like, "I'll kill as many people, I'll kill as many women and children as I need to to keep the peace." Yeah, exactly. Because like that's what Eiling is turning into. He's just yeah. Peacemaker. But yeah, Maddie, it's a great point. Like that line is so good and not only is it so great but that they were able to write a scenario in which a line like that really lands and actually carries a lot of meaning too because like out of context that could feel like a little bit blunt and pointed but here it actually feels like really grounded to the situation and really prescient and yeah okay okay fine you've turned me around on the episode it's really good <laughs> wow maddie you've done something that i've been trying to do for five years which is well, actually Chris's listen mind. to maddie that's the difference that's fair <laughs> It's wait, hold on. So you're saying that if we redo the Zeta and no, I'm here, yeah. no, <laughs> no, no, no force on earth would make me go back and rewatch Zeta. I'm sorry, Bob Goodman. I know you're a lovely person, but I'm not doing it. I can't. Fair enough. Can't. It's not his fault. It's, not. it's it's Kids WB's fault. I will never blame Kids WB for anything. <laughs> They've only made good choices with Lunatics Unleashed. Season one and season two. I also like something that we glossed past. I think it was in the uh, in the Sir Justin uh, segment of the fight was like, we definitely got a you people line out of Eileen mm-hmm. at one point. And I'm just I'm sitting here like, OK, the metaphor doesn't necessarily land because like I just super powered people aren't necessarily you know a a a like an oppressed minority yeah, exactly <laughs> at least not in this universe at the same time like with the 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 metaphors that they're trying to you know drag out i was just like man cuz like this was this was like when islamophobia was at its height oh, yeah. right like like post 911 and everything like and, and I, I know that for sure because I was raised in it. Like, I was fucking, like, given books for, for like, Christmas and birthday presents about the evils of Islam and stuff Jesus. like that. And so, like, looking at the political messaging of this specific episode and how it's about how America's acting post-9-11 and, and shit like that, like, 
that line mm-hmm. hit real hard. Like I was just like, I I, I was sitting there thinking, about, and like it it doesn't like. I get what they were intending. It doesn't necessarily like work in narrative, like the the longer you think about it, but it was appreciated nonetheless. Yeah, and you know, you raise a good point, which is I've seen like bits of trivia and bits of conversations with a lot of the writers on this who, you know, were consistently very critical of how the government basically handled things post 9-11 and yeah, the how far like the Patriot Act and a lot of that ideology went in terms of like changing things. And, you know, when we were all kids when we were watching this, so how, like, you know, we're not really aware of all of this, but it just goes to show like, you know, these writers actually like really were looking at the real world at the time and finding ways to incorporate a lot of their like fears and concerns and criticisms into a kid's cartoon, which you don't really appreciate until now when we have greater context for it. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it does speak to the level of sophistication on this. They were never concerned about just making something dumb and entertaining. They wanted to tell us things that were meaningful to them as well. And okay, damn it. Now it's a great episode. I'll finally, I'll acknowledge it. <laughs> Yay. It's going to make the short yes! list. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not, I did not go that far. Hey, we'll this is, this is, an, <laughs> this is the epilogue to the Cadmus arc. Okay. I will say this though. I think from that perspective, I actually think this, undoes more than it wraps up because like we already knew that Waller over time kind of changed her perspective in the league because of the ep- literally in the episode epilogue. And I think just because Eiling never reappears to my understanding and is just kind of like left floating out there in the ether, that to me feels like a loose plot thread that I find unsatisfying. Like it is really like the messaging, in the episode is really fantastic. But I think if you're talking about, adding on to the Cadmus arc, I don't think this actually adds a lot. Yeah, Maddie, back me up here. <laughs> what you're saying is when we finally end up getting hashtag JL reunion, uh, you just want Patriot Act part That's two. Exactly that's exactly it. Yeah, the, that's the fine. The only villain is going to be Great Island. Cameron, part two? Part Cameron, two? Cameron, Chris wants this to be a two-parter. All right, all right, here's the pitch. <laughs> what, what have I done? How, how have I... <laughs> We need Booster Gold. Situation. Who are the other non-powered characters in the league? <laughs> Booster Gold, bring him in. Blue Beetle now with Justice League Infinity. He's canon. Oh, there you okay. go. That that's outside of my 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 dome the of knowledge. The question. Oh hell yeah, the question come back. Y'all have to read Justice League Infinity. I know. I'm t- it's I'm, I'm way behind. On, I haven't started reading that, and I'm way behind on um, Batman Adventures continues. So. You're not missing anything. I know, but I've been literally like, I've, had, I've been subscribed to it this entire time. So every like month, I just get an email like, you've paid for another comic. I'm like, oh, fuck, I got to go read this at some point. <laughs> read, read Justice League Infinity. You can, you can leave Adventures Continue to the side. Oh, okay. I, I, I wanted that book to be so good. Read the two issues that Jordan Gibson uh, colored. Okay. Uh, not colored, uh, drew. Mm-hmm. He, he drew, God, which ones were it? Were it? There was, uh, I think it's like issue four of season two okay. and then the holiday special, which actually wasn't in Batman Adventures Continue. It was like in an anthology that DC put out oh, okay. I mean, in December. Me being me, I've bought them all and they're on my iPad and haven't read them. So I'm going <laughs> to read them all at some point. So um, even if it's begrudgingly. Get ready to be frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I will be. Any other uh, thoughts on this episode before we move on? I feel like we've covered my thoughts. Okay. I don't know if Cameron had anything else. I feel like he was in the middle of trying to pitch a second part. <laughs> no, I was on, on, on my toes trying to think of anything. When when they were like uh, announcing the backup coming in, the whole time I was just crossing my fingers for Booster Gold to pop up. And I was a little disappointed when he didn't, which I think is like the fun of that moment. It's like, you're supposed to be disappointed. Yeah, it's supposed to be underwhelming, which is fantastic. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, the Great Brain Robbery. So in this episode, an attempt to locate Grodd through the Flash's mind goes awry, and Flash and Luther swap minds into each other's bodies. While the League tries to stop Lex from escaping the Watchtower and Flash's body, Flash must pretend to be Lex and lead a train heist, lest he is discovered. So right up at the top, Maddie, what was it about this episode in particular that made you want to come on and talk about it? Because I have a personal story related oh, to all it, right. of course. Um, so, so back in God, what was it? 2013, I believe mm-hmm. it was. Uh, I was in an emo hardcore band. 
uh, Incredible. called My Brother the Ocean. Love this. It was a lot of fun. Had had so much fun doing the band. Mm. Uh, but we played a Halloween show one uh, one year. I think it was 2013. And it was like, if you come in a costume, you know, cover charge is, is cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, uh, since I was the one who booked it, I encouraged all of the local acts to, you know, also dress up yeah. in costumes and try to theme their bands and everything. And since this was around the time that I, like, finally started watching Justice League Unlimited, I was just like, okay, we're going to be the Justice League. We are going to dress up as the Justice League. So before the show... We were all dressed up uh, in, like, the Justice League's uh, uh, civilian clothing mm-hmm. uh, kind of situation. A thing that, like, nobody would have, like, really got it, except for, like, our bassist was dressed up in a fucking tux as Bruce <laughs> 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 uh, and, and And so, like, everyone's just, you know, like, what are you, what is y'all's, what is y'all's thing tonight? What are y'all doing? We wouldn't tell anybody. And so we finally came out as the Justice League. Uh, our bassist was Batman. Um, my our our drummer was Aquaman. I can't remember. I think our guitarist was Green Lantern. Okay. Hell yeah! I think and and I was a uh, I was Wally. Were you singer? Um, yes. Incredible. Yeah. So in between songs, when we're tuning and everything, we were using clips to set up the next song. Uh, and like we use the uh, the world of cardboard uh, at one because like when they punch, there's like a bass drop that goes into like the start of our mm-hmm. song, and it felt like it was gonna be cool. But there was one towards the start where I was like, okay, I want to get this flash mask off of my fucking face <laughs> as soon as possible because it's a morph suit. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and and so we used the uh, the clip from this episode of Lex, uh, you know, unmasking Wally. The, the, I don't know who this is, <laughs> as, as like, justification for me to get that thing off my fucking face, like, two songs in, because it was so hard to breathe. I've got photos from, the, from there, and I, th- and I think, I think that set is, like, actually online, like, in full song. Oh, really? I think, I think I, like, I think I threw it up on Vimeo or something at some point. I'll try to find yeah. it. It was not, like, it was not professionally recorded. Right. At all, but it was a fun time regardless. That that is brilliant that you use that moment because that is like one of the best moments in the whole episode. Of yeah, he literally like, oh, I can at least figure out what the Flash's identity is. Plugs the mask off. Like, I have no idea who the hell this is. God, like that that specific moment has just been like clipped in me. Yeah. for like forever, <laughs> and it it's 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 stuck <laughs> out as like. But there's there's so many good moments from this episode. That's just that's just one of the many. Yeah, this yeah. this is we've been talking about it for years. Mm-hmm. This is probably the second most quoted episode that we that we've had since uh, the last one being the one with the Flash and Trickster. Oh yeah, Flash and Substance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, Flash is just a quotable. Lad. He is. Yeah. It, he's he's so much fun, and you know they they get into the plot of it pretty quickly. Like pretty quickly figure out how like to force a brain swap situation which is like a combination of dr fate's magic and like rod and lex's like mind technology but i think for me the most fun thing in this whole episode is that they swap voice actors too so now all of a sudden you know clancy brown is playing wally west and michael rosenbaum is you know very fittingly playing lex luther having done it before on smallville but like to hear them impersonate each other's characters is so much fun. Clancy Brown in particular, I think for me really steals this episode, like bringing in that sort of like tonality and energy to the flash, but still in his voice, it's endlessly funny to listen to. No, cause I'm evil. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. Yes. laughs> that, that is my, my second favorite quote from this episode. <laughs> It's Dr. Polaris asking, you're not going to wash your hands? No, because I'm evil. Like, which, which has a lot more weight to it now that we're living in a fucking pandemic. It does, actually, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Flash is the worst person to have to, like, be undercover amongst the Legion of Doom. So, <laughs> like, he... He's so out of his depth, which would make it so entertaining. Well, in all all aspects but one, 
because there's one villain who was very happy that Wally came <laughs> along. Miss Talia, or Tala. Tala. Uh, apparently, we learned canonically, Lex is not good in bed. I mean... And canonically, you also learned Wally is. Are, are we surprised? Well, sorry, we'll rephrase that. Not good in bed. Is a gracious lover. Exactly. And that that is the very <laughs> obvious. Of course, Lex is not a gracious lover. He's a very self-centered person. Are we surprised about this at all? I think my favorite part about that, uh, there, there's, there's, there's aspects of, of that situation that are kind of like, the more you think about it, the more it's just like, oh, this is oh no. a little this sketchy. Is, this is kind of. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting into some uh, Revenge of the Nerds territory. Yes. But just the, 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 the best part of it, when Grodd finds out that it's Wally and Lex's body and Tala comes in. And like I don't, I don't think Grodd knows that her and Wally like just fucked. But he says, "Tala, I I miss when I used to be able to bend you to my will." Mm -hmm. Right there in front of Wally, and he's he's just like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm now I'm now you know penis cousins with the monkey." <laughs> yeah, it's it's such a weird weird situation. And yeah, camera to your point, it's like. When you're an adult, you look back and it's like, oh, there is like some very questionable decisions around consent happening. I, I know they're also partly playing this for laugh because, you know, uh, Wally, the, you know, constantly unlucky in love person who's always like flirting with everyone and never finding any sort of success, like all of a sudden does and is very overwhelmed and surprised by it. Um, it's very bizarre. And I, and I do like at the very end, though, when and Tala realizes that normal Lex is back. She's very disappointed. Yeah, she's not doing a lot to protect him. <laughs> no, not happy about what that means. But it's clear that like the writers really knew how to make this fun and funny, but also make it work in context. Like I really love how Lex knows exactly how to use Flash's powers to his advantage all the time. Like the fact that he goes up to the like the Zeta Beam technician holds his fingers to his head, it looks silly initially, like he's you know doing like a fake gun to the guy's head, but he's like, I will vibrate my fingers and it'll go straight through your skull. He actually knows how to make the Flash's powers deadly in a way that Wally I'm sure is aware of, but actively avoids because that's not the kind of person that he is. I didn't think about this while I was watching the episode, but now that you bring it up, like the fact that last season like he was trying to put himself in like an amazo body and like bond with brainiac and everything mm -hmm. and it, it adds more weight to that it yeah. makes it a lot more terrifying like what would lex be like with powers we get the answer to it like he doesn't he doesn't have the amazo ability to absorb everyone's powers but he's just got the flash and immediately is making death threats yeah well and and he is constantly defeating all the other league members like, he knows how to go up against, like, even GL, who is one of the most powerful members, and he's able to stop him because he knows how to use the powers. And it, it is really, really scary. I hadn't thought about that, but it's a good point. Like, it shows us why the stakes are so high that Lex not reunite with Brainiac because he would be absolutely terrifying. And, and actually, now that I think about it, it's also interesting, too, because Flash is the one that defeated him. He had Brainiac. And Flash is the only one that could stop him. And now it seems kind of like full circle that he gets the Flash abilities. This isn't a funny episode. It's a scary episode. <laughs> it's a scary episode. <laughs> like, it's a warning. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But you're right. At its core, like, it really does establish why this is so dangerous. That Lex, you know, get access to anything that can make him more powerful. Because just with his mind, he's able to, you know, constantly thwart his other Legion members, right? I mean, even when Dr. Polaris, like, threatens to basically have a coup... Lex shuts him down and tells him, like, oh, yeah, all of you who got, you know, repowered and modified by me. Yeah, there's fail safes and all of those. So don't fuck with me. And this is after he no longer has any fucking superpowers. And one of the people on, like, the Legion, as dumb as he is, Bizarro, mm -hmm. has the powers of Superman. Yeah, there were, there were two thoughts that I had when they when they Im immediately switched minds. I love the moment where uh, Wally first gets up in Lex's body and he tries to run to the door and is immediately winded. Right. Like, that is the most relatable moment I've seen in all of JLU uh, and all of the Timverse. Uh, but the other, and I, I think, uh, Maddie, as you just described it, I think answers my question really succinctly, is, like, if you were woken up in a, in a super-powered body, how long would it take you to understand, like, 
like how strong you were and and you know mentioning that the flat or that, that lex has kind of been anticipating this moment for years now uh he kind of knows how to handle this but like if you woke up and you immediately have super speed like you wouldn't know how to stop you wouldn't mm-hmm. know how to like not be in super speed all the time yeah and I, I love that Lex has probably spent years just like sitting there and stewing, thinking about what he would do if he had these powers and just being so annoyed at watching, especially like Wally as powerful as he is basically just being a jokester and not taking it seriously at all. It must drive him insane knowing that there's these powers exist. He doesn't have them. You know, you think about it and, and his obsession with Superman going all the way back to Superman, the animated series has like always been about power. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you think about specifically the, uh, the, the, the switch with Wally, we had the, the whole Superman, the animated series episode where they were trying to see who was faster, who had, yeah. you know, more power in that aspect, whether it was Superman or Wally. And while we never found out, like as the audience, because it ended in a tie, it, it's you know from the the standpoint of Lex Luthor, you know I'm sure that probably caught attention and was like, wait, this guy like he may not have as many powers as Superman, but on one, he's level with him, and, and so waking up in that body had like had to be a step towards, and like like you said, Wally was the one who was able to take him down, so. At this point, Lex might even be like, wait, Wally is more powerful than Superman. Yeah. The more you, like, dissect it, it's just frightening. Well, yeah, because I, I was thinking in the middle of it, like, I know, like, GL is kind of holding back because they said, like, we, we don't want to hurt the body. Yeah. But also it shows, like, how powerful Wally would be if Wally took things seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, he is unstoppable. He yeah. takes down, you see that hallway where every league member is down. Yeah. You know, he, he takes out GL with a bowl of pudding. So. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, there are those little moments where, like, the fla- I, you don't think Lex would do that. But, like, it's still the Flash. So you, you have to do those kind of gimmicks every now and then. Well, it, and I can also see Lex, you know, he'll utilize any asset he has at his disposal, which in this case, like, was the cafeteria and all the forks and knives and, and the food. But you can also see him, like, he's a dick, right? So you could see him just putting a little bit of that spite in there, knowing, like, oh, I took you guys out with a bowl of pudding. Yeah. And you'll always and know also, that he I can. Also knows, he also <laughs> knows that GL won't do anything to hurt him. So he can kind exactly. of get away with a, a few more things. It's 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 wild, and I, I really love all that stuff up on the the watchtower. And then you know, on the other side of things, you have Wally and Lex's body, and they're about ready to do this you know this train robbery, making the the whole title of the episode even more fun. And I love that he, you know he doesn't know what the plan is, so he's like, okay, you all tell me your part of the plan. And he slowly figures out that it's this. It's actually a very simple like evil plot. It's basically like that you know Cosnia is now joining the EU, and they're getting a massive influx of euros, and they're just going to rob the train carrying all of the euros. Like this is. How do you like, think Brexit has affected Cosnia? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I, I did have a moment. Like, I, I don't know how that sort of thing works. Like, if someone joins, you know, when someone joins the EU and they have to change up their currency, like, I would even think that just the, the, the creation of the, what, probably hundreds of millions. I forget what they say. It was like 600 million. 100 million. 100 million. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, even just the creation of, like, 100 million euros, like, the inflation wouldn't that mm-hmm. be a, a thing? I, again, I'm not an economist. I don't know how it all works, but I, I had a moment of like, I, I wonder if that's how that actually works. I don't know. Chris, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Money's fake. <laughs> well, I know. I know it's <laughs> fake, but... But, just, but, I, but by the fake rules that we make. To right, yeah, I know money's fake. So it's like, okay, it's, yeah. So like the inflation in of itself is like semi-artificial because it's, they just, you know, literally generated more cash. But like, is that then theoretically offset by like the you know, GDP increase that comes with now having Cassie be part of the EU. Again, I don't know how this works. Yeah, because you have a whole new population coming in to now spend the money and new shops coming in to to retrieve the money. But also, this is a cartoon talking about a (laughs) fake principle, so it's fake, (laughs) fake money. But I still love to talk about it. Yeah, but it's real money in a fake cartoon, so that's what I'm curious. On a more (laughs) nitty-gritty level, where the fuck are the Kaznian people supposed to go to get these euros and get rid of their their 
Kaznia, Kaznia bucks. I don't yeah, know what they, is what is the currency the of Kaznia. Yeah, they go to the bank and, like, and change them out. The last the last time we saw Kaznia, like it's a it's a war torn country. Like mm. everyone's impoverished. Like it, it's weird that like they're just like yeah they're joining the EU now. Things are good for Kaznia. Like everything's twice. everything's different. Like yeah. I just want to know more about Kaznia. I want like. <laughs> I mean, clearly the princess is doing a great job since she took over. So True. learning some of those life lessons from Wonder Woman and, and putting them to good use. Um, well, when's the last time in the real world we saw a currency switch in a country? I I don't know. I'm a I'm a podcaster, Cameron. <laughs> it's it's happening. It's happening right now. We're going from U.S. dollars to NFTs. <laughs> yeah, we are. You're not wrong. <laughs> How many poorly drawn monkeys does that thing cost? Uh, <laughs> Can we? Can we turn this podcast into an NFT? Is that how that works? I don't know. Sure. <laughs> let's let's not find out. <laughs> let's not find out. No one would buy it anyways if they could. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's what's interesting is that they more or less get away with it. Like they are essentially like at the point when they are getting ready to load all the money onto um, like the, the ship and get out of there. And it's just like it. It seems weirdly easy in this universe for them to pull off this heist. And I get that they have Sinestro, they have lots of like super high power people, but you're also wondering like how how does how is there not an infrastructure in place to like immediately respond to a threat like this? Like where's the call to the league? Well, I have I have a, a much broader question for all of this. Mm -hmm. Tala can make portals. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why are they just portaling there and back? Yeah, why not just like literally portal the train into like the swamp, unload everything, or just like portal, portal themselves? Yeah, just portal themselves into the train. Yeah. Why do they need to fly there? Why are they loading it back onto their plane mm -hmm. when they could just open a portal and push it all just straight through from the train? This is this is what Lex was missing. Like this is why Lex needed to be there. I think. Well, I think the the episode answers that question for you in that Lex doesn't really care about Tala. Oh, yeah. that is true. That's true. Yeah, that, that's a good point. He would never want to give her control over the whole plan. He needs to have a lot of different people involved so he can have contingencies in place and to screw them over whenever he needs to at his whim. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, eventually they figure out a way to, like, get them swapped back. And, of course, you know, they are immediately able to figure out that it, it's Wally as he threatens to, you know, share GL's, like, childhood nickname but that I love that none of the Legion believe that it's actually Lex who's come back, and they're basically threatening to, like, torture him until he reveals it, and that's when he, you know, shows his, his ace up the sleeve and takes out Dr. Polaris and threatens all of them, because you know, at the end of the day, he's just a, a dick. And he, he's just like Batman, right? He has plans in place. He just doesn't care. He'll use them whenever he wants. Okay, so my question mm -hmm. after this episode, how would every other League member do if they had to switch brains with a, a evil counterpart. Cause I, you, you mentioned that, that uh, Wally is probably the worst one to choose cause he's the least evil, but I, I would argue Superman would have no idea how to do anything. I disagree. Superman's already has, has two entirely different identities uh, and, and has, you know, kept a separating line between himself and Clark Kent uh, and I think he'd be able to, having known Lex for so long, would be able to act that out. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think I think Superman could blend in. Batman would obviously take it as an opportunity to undermine every single person in the room as much as he possibly could. Batman would fucking clear. Season would be over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole the whole universe would be done. He'd go through and immediately find a way to take out all. He would realize that Lex has contingencies in place and just turn them all on at once and take out the entire Legion. We already saw last time they kidnapped, kidnapped yeah. Batman that even without Lex's body, he already controlled the League. Yeah, w way back in Secret Society, yeah, when he literally took out the entire League despite being, or the Legion of Doom, or I guess, at, again, the Secret Society, he was able to take them all out even though he had his hands chained and all he had was just words at his disposal, and he took them down. GL would be fine. GL, yeah, he would catch on pretty quick. I think he would be fine. He could blend in. I don't think Wonder Woman would even attempt to blend in. I think she would immediately just start, like, beating the shit out of people and trying to get out of there as fast as possible. Well, yeah, because that, that is the other question is, like, who else would they have... Like, let's not go into the assumption they all switch minds with Lex. Uh, 
like what would their counterparts so like if she switches minds with cheetah she she could pretty much easily probably just take out everyone and, and escape well and and she's she's just like a warrior at the end of the day like so she's her answer is gonna be to beat everybody i don't know if the story would uh uh would work as well though if yeah it it, yeah that's switching true minds with legs yeah. Right? Like, I mean, it's not its not like Flash switched minds with Gorilla Grodd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but also, like, this season we've seen Wonder Woman is trying to work on her diplomacy. True. It's like, she would try, I think, to, to have the conversation and then beat everybody up. I don't know. Because, like, we also, uh, uh, like, if we, if we want to do a direct one-to-one with that, uh, we also had another episode where Flash was, like, in the den of villainy of his own villains. And he acted, uh, he acted a bit different there than he did here. Like, I don't think that they would necessarily be like, let me do the thing Wonder Woman would do. It would just be, let me do the thing that, like, I think Lex would do. Uh, just not wash his hands. And, and, and it, yeah. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's I, I think it's more about their perception of Lex than it is about what they would personally want to get done. Okay, that that is true. Yeah, and from that context, yeah, Superman would would understand the role. Yeah, he he can make it work. Um, there, there's one other fun little thing that happened this episode that I had to bring up, which is we do learn uh, where the Flash falls in the uh, Justice League ID code. We Stack. do. He's number six because we have speculated at length about where everyone falls, and I, I do not remember everyone up to this point. Um, but we've 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 Wonder had Woman assumed, is three, yeah. Wonder Woman's um, three. I think GL might have been four, something like that. But I, what I, we've speculated that maybe the Flash would be at the bottom at number seven, and we've learned that he's number six, which I think still leaves room for Superman to be number seven because Batman would be that kind of spiteful dick. You don't think Superman's number two? I th- I'm trying to remember. I think was Batman number one, or do we know Batman's? Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 do you, hold do on. you know the list? Chris, yeah. Chris, look at, no, look at it this way. We're saying Flash is number six, but he's not number six. He's zero, zero, six. It's a, it's a three digit thing. Oh, you think someone's zero, zero, zero? No, so what you're, what you're asking is who is 007? You are right. You are 100% right. Who in this universe is 007? <laughs> Oh, even subconsciously, my brain needed to know the answer to that. <laughs> Would Bruce give... I mean, we can assume that Batman is a James Bond fan, right? Yeah. Can we make that assumption? He is. Batman The Adventures Continue... Uh, oh, that's uh, right. ...has, has him, and, him and Tim wanting to go see the new James Bond movie. That's great. I, I, don't, think he would, I don't think he would give anyone 007 just, in, like, just to honor uh, James Bond. The, the number's been retired. If, J- if James Bond ever wants <laughs> yeah. to join the league. Yeah, he retired the number, so no one else could have it. <laughs> 007 is king from Batman Beyond as portrayed See, by there George we go. There we go. Yeah, I just, I love that. I love that we always thought that Flash would be, like, you know, of the original seven, the lowest ranked one, and we, we know he's not. So the question remains, who is 007? Uh, but yeah, this this whole episode was really really fun and silly but in a way that just was delightful like it's it's such a fun time for sure i love i love that it's i love that it's back to back with an episode that's like much more thoughtful it's like yeah we gave we gave you something to chew on last week anyway uh here's a joke that we came up because lex luthor is, is is the flash in smallville well, I mean, I also there's there's one bit joke at the very beginning, which I also love that really sets the tone. And it's when Lex enters the main hall with all the villains and like, OK, we accepted you as our new leader. We hated that whole thing about him turning everyone into into monkeys. What's your plan? So Are you going to make us all bald? Yeah. And I'm like, that is such a great like, Sinestro just like <laughs> digging in immediately, which makes me laugh even more. Knowing that Mark Strong played him in a couple years later, and we did get bald Sinestro. Oh, that's right. Yeah, was that in the was that in the Ryan Reynolds movie? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He played Sinestro. I think he saw the Widow's Peak. Oh, did he? Yeah, oh. he's he's got the little Vegeta going on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, oh, I mean, Mark Strong, perfect casting, perfect casting. Oh Sinestro. yeah, it's it's the super 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 pushback hairline. I, I still yeah. have not watched that movie. I, I will at either. one point. I will at one point. I know. But bonus like, episode. 
Exactly. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to watch it. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts on this episode before we uh, move on to some plugs here? It was a blast. I had fun. Well, good. Those are my thoughts. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, then let's do some uh, some bat plugs here. And Maddie, as our guest of honor, uh, what do you have to plug? Oh, God. Um, I mean, well, I assume if you are listening to Tim talk, you might also be a Watchtower Database fan, uh, which is what I am, I am on, I am a part of. Um, we just today, as we are recording, mm-hmm. uh, released the newest ep- uh, issue of our webcomic legacies of the dcau oh shit um it is it is based in 2019 uh the the dcau's 2019 which is Mm -hmm. around the time of batman's retirement uh and it kind of kind of moves forward that plot thread that we've uh seeded uh with the last i think couple of issues uh and it's a lot of fun i just read it right before coming on because they didn't give it to me early uh but (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a blast. Um, we've also been doing a lot of Batman: The Adventures Continue and Justice League Infinity breakdowns. Uh, and you know, if you if if you're just like, no, no, Tim Talk is good. That that's my fill of DCAU content. Well, guess what? I've got a fucking Ben Ten video coming out sometime soon. That's right. You keep making reference to this epic Ben Ten video. I, I don't know. I don't know the date specifically, but we're trying to get it out by the end of the month. Okay. Uh, I, I just filmed the majority of the footage for it the other day. I've just got like one last thing that I've got to film. Uh, I'm really excited for that. I've spent the last year with this, uh, not, not, not even the whole franchise, just the first show mm-hmm. of the franchise. I spent the last year with it. I watched it twice. I tried to figure out why people like it. Uh, and it took, me, it took me some time to, 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 to click with it. Uh, and so the video is very much going to be going through my journey, uh, with it. <laughs> You're slow to set into madness. My, my complaints, the, the things that I hated, uh, <laughs> up, up to me finding something in it that is for me that, uh, mm-hmm. that, that you connected with me on an emotional level after going back through it a second time. And I'm really excited for, for people to see that one. It's, uh, I have not ever worked on a video for this amount of time. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Which is the the country that like super stuck on to Big Ten, Ben Ten? Didn't they have like a huge Brazilian fan base? Maybe it, it, it was. It was. I thought it was like a Nordic country. I thought it was like Norway or Sweden or Finland. I I had this talk with one of my college professors about it because I think he wrote one episode, um, where like it it blew up the way that Pokemon blew up in America. Where like toy stores, like Toys R Us, was converted to like the Ben Ten store that just sold other toys. Huh. Like it took over huh. the like the entertainment space for one country. Interesting. And like that, that's why it lasted so long. Is like they were making so much money overseas. Like we will just keep making the show. Dang, good on him. I I have never seen Ben Ten. I know little to nothing about it. I, well, it's fun. It's really fun. I'm I'm excited to get to the next series in the franchise. Uh, it's got Dwayne McDuffie on board. Uh, uh, the, this 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 first season had a lot of uh, had a lot of DCAU creatives attached, but mm-hmm. it was a uh, it wasn't like necessarily like the the high tier creatives. And so like when I would see like uh, an episode from somebody I knew, like it was like Marty Eisenberg or whoever. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, like they made some fine Batman episodes, whatever. But like yeah. just going into a show that I had no previous uh, like attachment to, it was just, it, it was, it's difficult. It's, it's hard to figure out, you know, what to like about a show that so many people your age are nostalgic for that you've just never been a part of. Cause like a lot of, a lot of it's just attached to the youth ness yeah. of, 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 of experiencing it. And like, I think that's something I figured out because the more I watch it, I'm like, okay, like there's a lot of cool creature designs and stuff like that. And like, I've found myself going out and actively buying Ben 10 merch because I like the aesthetic of it. But from a narrative standpoint, it was, a uh, it was hard to figure out what to talk about, <laughs> but I, I, I finally did. I think this video is going to be like an hour long. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm hoping, hoping it clicks with people. <laughs> 
Well, congratulations on surviving your own personal heart of darkness into the world of Ben 10. <laughs> I mean, outside of like the, the Watchtower database stuff, um, is there anything like else you watched recently or read recently that you really love that you want people to check out? Um, you know, I'm going through, uh, I'm going through a rewatch of Dr. Who, uh, oh, nice. Fiance. Okay. Yeah. And that's been a lot of fun. I watched, uh, like the, um, the Eccleston all the way up to like the start of Capaldi, uh, mm-hmm. years and years ago. Uh, and I kind of fell off and it's been a blast going back and revisiting it. Uh, we've, we've been doing the, the like Hooniverse though. So not just Dr. Who, but also Torchwood oh, and okay. Sarah Jane adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll say that for the most part, the spinoffs are kind of, kind of skippable, mm-hmm. uh, feeling it, it, there's some fun stuff to them, but so much of the, the, the heart of that world is obviously in the doctor himself. And yeah, it's been, it's been fun to revisit. I, I did the same thing a number of years ago, like kind of got up to the beginning of the Capaldi, Capaldi era and, and fell off. Um, where, where is it streaming somewhere now? It's all, it's all on HBO max. Oh, nice. Okay. Which is also where I've been watching the matrix, uh, series. Oh, I finally, yeah. I, I, I'm really wanting to watch Resurrections. I've heard a lot of back and forth about it. Uh, I don't I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but yeah, I, I rewatched the original trilogy prior to watching the new one. And I remember I, I forget if I've talked about this on the show yet or not, but the, the original trilogy, like I remember being a little bit disappointed by the sequels when I saw them uh, in theaters. And, but revisiting them now, there's actually a lot of really fantastic stuff in them. And they both the sequels went up in my esteem on a rewatch. I will say this about resurrections. There are some really, really fascinating, brilliant ideas in there, particularly like the first half hour overall, though, I did not find the movie particularly entertaining and it didn't have the scale or the spectacle that the original ones did. Like, you know, even if you don't love, those sequels, you can at least pinpoint to like one set piece is absolutely brilliant. That you will like just go back and watch on YouTube. Right. Um, and there's really nothing I felt like that about this new one, but I think it's still worth watching if you're really intrigued by that world. Right. Um, yeah. No, yeah. like I've, I've a lot of the, a lot of the back and forth that I've seen uh, just from being so heavily online, it, it has been like, there's a pretty clear uh, like defining line of like, it seems like most of the straight guys that I know, are just like, yeah, fuck this movie. Mm-hmm. But, but like, people who are queer, and more so, like, the trans people that, uh, that I follow and talk to yeah. have, been, have, have been much more forgiving all the way into, like, thinking it's a fucking masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see where I end up falling on that uh, yeah. once I get to it. We've watched the first two movies, and we were going to watch the third one yet yesterday, but... I watched Justice League Unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> we diverted you from your journey to, to join us. Um, yeah, but no, I, I definitely recommend it. It's worth watching, Resurrections. So, uh, Cameron, what about you? What do you got to plug this week? Um, what have I been watching? I uh, Cobra Kai Season 4 came out, uh, and it's... Uh, I, I'm so torn on this show, because, like, I love it, obviously, because it's bad. It's bad. It's bad, entertaining content. <laughs> but it's like, it's it's one of those shows where I'm almost embarrassed to talk about how much I enjoy it, and it, it takes a lot to embarrass me on on the content that I watch. That is a true statement. Has never been spoken. Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. And I don't know why, because like it's not a it's not a bad show by any means. But it, it you just said it is. Be- <laughs> make it up does, your mind that's why i'm so torn on yeah. it it does seem to be kind of like universally beloved though despite like quality aside people really seem to love it no matter what so yeah it's they they understand the basics of character development and the very basis of storytelling and they just do the basics so well mm-hmm. um but everything else around it the dialogue the the writing is atrocious <laughs> um so but it's 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 still fun so is this a plug or not i don't know i don't know we'll say yes we'll say yes to cobra kai maybe you need to sit and simmer with it for a little while longer before you. i have been for four seasons (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, I, I have said it as a mission to, at some point, watch the original movie so I can start watching the series because everyone tells right, me Right, because you, you have it. not seen Karate Kids. No, I, the only Karate Kid movie I have seen in its entirety is the next Karate Kid with Hilary Swank, which I do remember seeing in theaters. Which is the, the same as someone saying the only Fast and Furious I've seen is Tokyo Drift. Yeah, but... but what I'm saying is you've seen the best one. Yeah, I was saying, yeah but your standards. <laughs> Y'all could rebrand to Karate Talk. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kick back, kicking back. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I recommend it. The Karate Kids are very fun. Yeah, I'll watch them. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then after all the, the Harry Potter stuff happening this past weekend, I decided to take a break from the, the Wizarding World uh, and go back into my other childhood stories. And I started rereading the Percy Jackson books. Oh, OK. Uh, and they're so fun. They're definitely aged younger than i remember okay so who is reading the audiobook that you're listening to cameron uh let me tell you i can pull it up <laughs> called out <laughs> and not not that i have any problem with audiobooks you know i obviously love the audio medium being a podcaster but i always have to call you out because you say you're reading something and i am I'm going digesting to be pedantic about it and say that you're technically not reading it jesse bernstein okay is, is narrating this audiobook <laughs> I am digesting the Percy Jackson series again. There we go. <laughs> You're enjoying your engaging. Yes. I've actually never read those, so I, I don't have much to talk about on that. I, I've only read the first four. Sorry. I've only uh, experienced the first four. There we go. Uh, and I think there's seven altogether. Okay. Six or seven. So I, I seem to, to I'm, I'm going to try and uh, crank it out to the end this time. Okay. Yeah. I see. I saw the first movie. It was fine. So. Yeah. And I think Disney plus or HBO max is, is Disney plus, uh, it is, uh, making it a series. Soon. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Uh, and I think they're attempting to cast the right age characters this time. Oh, uh, well, yeah, they're always too old in the movies, aren't they? Yeah. Because it's with Dylan O'Connor, Dylan O'Brien. No, no, that one actors. was Logan Lerman. That's right. I'm yeah. thinking Maze Runner. Yes, that one's Dylan uh, O'Brien. Yes. Yeah, I enjoy Dylan O'Brien more. <laughs> yes, yeah, I love me some Dylan O'Brien. Yeah. I know all of these names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what about you, Chris? I, I'm hoping you plug something that we briefly talked about. Oh, I guess I can. Okay. Um, yes, I did watch and finish Arcane. I'm so proud of you. Um, Thank you. I I had heard from a lot of people, Cameron included, that it's really, really great, even if you're not a League of Legends person. Um, and so I started it, and I had a hard time getting into it the first three episodes. But then at the end of the third episode, like, is really kind of the inciting incident of the series. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that point on, I was I was pretty much hooked, and I really I really enjoyed it at the end. And it, and it is it is gorgeous. The action in it is fantastic. The music is great all the way through. Um, so yes, I, I I will say I ultimately did up quite enjoying it a lot. It just took a little while. It's it's yeah, a lot of going yeah. on in that world. It's a very complex world. Lots of world building. Lots of characters. And it was very unclear where it was going until it finally like dug in its heels and got going. And then it's pretty great. So this I is did... such a big victory for me just to hear you admit anything that I've pitched is good. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> like cut that I had nothing to do with the show. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, gonna, am... I'm gonna cut that slightly and tell you that you were not the first person that pitched it to me. Uh, I'm no, really... I don't. I don't care. I don't yeah. care at all. The <laughs> fact that you enjoyed something that I pitched just brings me so much joy that I didn't think I could feel after five years. <laughs> well, I mean, that's been my life's mission doing this podcast is to <laughs> keep joy from you while we do it. <laughs> um. But yes, I did that. I finally, I finally fucking finished Dune, which I've been reading since the beginning of September. By the end, I really enjoyed it. It just took a long time. So for anyone who's out there who's considering reading it, if you give it time, it's worth it by the end. But it was kind of slow. I finished that. And then uh, last night I had a double feature. I watched Sister Act 1 and Sister Act 2 back in the habit. Amazing. <laughs> They're both Do on they Disney+. Hold up? Plus. Um, the second one is like, it's, it's good. The second one's good. The first one I have to say is great. I'd never seen it before. Those were, those were like core childhood movies for me. Yeah, for some they reason. are for so many people and I just never saw them, but they, yeah, it's like I said, they're both on Disney plus. The first one especially is absolutely worth the watch. Whoopi Goldberg is so funny and so charming. Just the whole movie is just really cute 
and charming, and I absolutely adored it. So a very strong bat plug on my part for Sister Act. Um, but I think that does it for us this week. We got through everything. Um, Maddie, thank you once again for joining us. Like I said, very long overdue and very much appreciated. Uh, if people want to reach you or find your stuff, what's the best place for them to look? Yeah, I'm glad to be here after so long. Um, but if you, if you want to find me online, I am at Maddie Washburn on Twitter, uh, at executive producer Dick Wolf on, uh, on Instagram. I've been holding on to that one for so long, hoping he'll eventually buy it from me and I won't ever have to work ever again, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> um, or, or of course, uh, anywhere, uh, you can find Watchtower Database, uh, we are at DCAU Watchtower on most, uh, most, most things. You probably would want to follow that one more than following me personally, <laughs> just on account of, I have ADHD and I'm way too online, and so I'm just clogging your feet all of the time. Well, more so on Twitter than Instagram, but yeah. you know. Hey, I, I follow you everywhere on all those places, you and Watchtower Database, it's well worth the follow for both. So, and well, I, I am, you. I am still <laughs> relentlessly overjoyed at your, your long running crusade here to try and get the Dick Wolf handle bought off of you. It's absolutely brilliant. I feel like I've had this since like 2013 and I was just yeah. thinking like, he'll get it from me eventually. He'll get it. And I think that I've like found out a little bit more recently that I think he has an Instagram that's just he, Dick Wolf. He probably does. And I'm just Wait, like, God, God damn it. <laughs> Take it from me, please. But who's going to know who he is if it doesn't have executive producer in front of his name? I get you. You would not believe how frequently I get tagged by people that I've never, <laughs> ever met who who are just like tagging me in Law and Order SVU memes. And I'm just like, that's not me, but thank you. But thank you. I, I love people who don't do that due diligence of like double checking this is actually the right person to tag something in. It's it's always it's always fun. <laughs> I even got like. One of one of uh, my fiance's friends recently like bought me an executive producer Dick Wolf hat because of how long I've That's had the Instagram. That's perfect. That's so good. Oh, uh, and then Cameron, where can people find you? Uh, if you want to find my art, you can find that at Cameron Dexter. And if you want to find my face, you can find that at Cam Dexter underscore Adventures. Wee. It's been a minute. Yes, it has been a minute. And, uh, yeah, you can find me at Lordifer on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find the show at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. We, uh, yes, yes, yes. we are approaching the end of our run here. We have three more episodes left. Hoping to have at least one more guest on in that time. And, and uh, then Titans Talk. Yep. And then, and then Titans Talk. I have nothing else to add to that. And then... <laughs> Bruce Tim has a new animated series coming out. You can't just cancel the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we, we shall see what happens. Let me put it that way. Well, I hope I hope to hear more from y'all because you guys have been my friends inside of the computer for so <laughs> long now and it's it's going to it's going to going to sting if like all of a sudden it's gone. I mean, obviously you guys will still be here, but I like right. hearing your voices talk about yeah. things that I like. <laughs> we 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 shall see what ends up happening. We we we've been talking about it. We'll figure something out. Um, but thank you, Matt. It's very, very, very sweet of you to say. And like I said, this was. Yeah, we'll see if this Hollywood big shot has time in his calendar for. I, I have a busy schedule. <laughs> what, what can I say? You know, uh, I'm a, Cameron, I'm a, start a podcast I'm with a your busy, mom. I'm a busy boy. <laughs> no, my mom also already has a podcast of her own, and it's already doing better than ours. And and you haven't plugged it. <laughs> have I plugged it? No, I'm not plugged it. Go back to bat plugs real quick. <laughs> I think you have way back in the day. I think you did. Probably. My mom and I have this have this weird uh, like subconscious competition with each other. Whenever one of us starts a new creative endeavor, the other one will like subconsciously also start that creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And so when we started Tim Talk, like two weeks later is when she started her podcast. Yeah. And then I, I started writing a book maybe two years ago. And about a month after I started, she started her book. And yeah, she well, got to publish before me. Well, which one is on the pod tower? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's really found that success there? Um, but uh, Maddie, this was so much fun to have you on. Uh, yeah, like you, you've become one of our favorite people, and the the gift of this show has been the awesome people that we have met, and you know, you are very much high on that list. And so to have you on the show finally, it's just been super delightful. 
you know, I, we've been lucky enough to join you guys for stuff on on stuff on the Watch Our Database, but we we have to kind of collect all the all you guys on our show at some point. So. Now y'all got to get a Ted, huh? I know, I know. I feel bad. I got to try and find a way to get Ted on at some point. But no, thank you for joining us. How close and, is he uh, to Titans? Exactly. <laughs> God. I don't know, actually. Goddamn Titans. <laughs> To be determined. But uh, thank you, Maddie, and thank you, everyone, for listening. And, uh, yeah, we will be back. Our next episode, we will be covering Grudge Match and Far From Home. Oh, ooh, oh these are good episodes. These are very good, are good episodes. episodes. Those are good episodes. I, very exciting. I almost, like, once Great Brain Robbery stopped last night, I looked over at my fiance and I was like, I don't, I don't want to make you do more episodes. But this <laughs> next one's like really fucking good. It's really good. I've been looking forward to Grudge Match in particular for a really long time. So I'm excited to get to that. Um, but thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Beautiful. Thank Perfectly you. rehearsed. <laughs> no second takes here. <laughs>